So two hellos today. I usually do two hellos, but not precisely two hellos. So first one goes to you uh, out there in <laughs> TV land or computer land or wherever you're at. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we still, once in a while, it surprises me some of the people, some of you who will respond and say, you know, I can't ever be there, but I sure appreciate being able to watch this online. And we appreciate you sharing that. Uh, it's good to know, uh, it's good to have feedback. So thank you, and thank you for being with us today as we worship here at Denver Fringe Church. And the other hello obviously goes to those of you who are live and in person. You're the ones that really make us nervous up here. Those folks don't bother us. Um, no, you don't make us nervous. That's actually comforting to have brothers and sisters in Christ. And I will never forget the first Sunday we recorded after, I don't know, six weeks maybe or four weeks uh, of not having services. And the first time we had people here and singing, it was just glorious. It could have been the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing. It's just how it felt. So uh, sing with your whole heart today and really listen to God's word. You're going to get a chance to read his word out loud. And, and, you know, we'll only go through it once. And I try to pace you so we don't read too fast uh, because you take it in. Uh, whatever God's word says to you today, be ready for it. So uh, we're going to do something a little, I'm going to do something a little strange this morning. Shock, shock. You say, first time ever I've ever done anything strange. Um, and it has to do with Advent. Uh, the, the Latin word for Advent is Adventus. You can put that up. It means a couple of things, coming and arrival. The strange thing is, we didn't do anything last week for Advent. I still don't have any real candles here. And I worried about that, but I thought, you know what? That's okay, too, because even if they were real, we'd be putting them out anyway later. And the folks at home, you know, we, it, the point is really the light and the um, preparation. So this is officially the second day of Advent for most, a lot of Christian groups. How many of you grew up in a setting where you, you practiced Advent on a regular basis? Yeah, I figured we'd have a few more than that. Every uh, denomination has its own take on this. If you look at pictures of Advent candles, you'll find all different colors. In some groups, there's five. Some groups, there's four. They stand for different things. Um, so uh, in that respect, there is no specific way to do this, I suppose. So for today, we're going to do it with pictures of candles. Two are lit. This is the second... Uh, week for you, the second Saturday, the second Sunday of Advent. And I want us to read together um, Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. So let's do that together, and you should be able to see it too, so you read along with us as we read Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and the hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. And just repeat those last several lines. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. In most circles, this second Advent Sunday is focused on peace as far as the Advent candle is concerned. So I'll read a, a portion of Second Peter chapter 3, and we have one more slide to read together, and then Karen Berge will, will play for us on her flute. First Peter 3. 
beginning with verse 8. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to a new heavens and new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends... While you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And a different version of 2 Peter 3.14 there. Let's read that together. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. you, Karen. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, God with us shall come to thee, O Israel. And has, in fact, come to us. And God with us is a reality that we get to celebrate together this season and every season. Um, That's just hitting me, I suppose. (laughs) 
I like it when it does that. Um, <laughs> would you stand? Uh, we're going to sing together and pray that um, the words from songs that we've sung so many times will land a little differently this season, will will cause us to connect with the miracle of God sending his son to us, Emmanuel.
Excelsis Deo. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains.
And Lord, would you continue to this, this very different year in this very different way? Remind us that you are remarkable. And that this, the gift that we celebrate can and does just change it all. And that somehow in these different circumstances that it would be made clearer. That it would bring an extra layer of joy and peace this season. We're so thankful to you. You who fulfill your promises. You who do what you said you would. Thank you for being with us. Amen. You may be seated. When Haley uh, told me what she had chosen us to, for us to sing this morning, she said, it's all about the angels. <laughs> and it was. Uh, familiar songs to all of us. As we were singing, um, I thought about a friend of mine in Brazil who came to the United States partially to learn to speak English as a young man and um, just to kind of get away from his life in Brazil, in part. And he was brave enough to just show up and get a job and begin to learn to speak English, just immersed himself in it. Don't know how long he was here, but 9-11 happened at some point. And he just was overwhelmed. He was 20, 21 years old, and he just thought, I need to get home. And everything about his life was just so unsure. Didn't know where he was going, what he was doing. And he'd, he'd done this thing of coming to the States, learning to speak English. Had a good job uh, and all of that. But just a lot of pressures in his life, both here and there. Um, but anyway, he got on a plane, headed home. And he was just in such turmoil. And someone was sitting next to him. I, I really can't remember if it was male or female, to be, be honest with you. But uh, they started talking to him and sharing the gospel. They could sense that he was in turmoil. And, and he'd been raised in a home where he knew about Jesus. Um, but he was probably just religious about it. Didn't have a personal relationship with Christ at all. This person ended up leading him to, to Christ. And it was a powerful moment in his life. I mean, he could, it was one of those conversion experiences where he knew there was a change on that airplane. And so uh, he asked for information. Where can I get a hold of you? I said, well, I work for this organization. And he said, oh, yeah, I've heard of this mission organization. My, um, I have friends who work in it. So well, I work with them, and here's my name and phone number. And you can try to get a hold of me when we get to Brazil. Well, eventually he tried. He called the number, got nothing. Never. And then he started asking around this organization, which is a fairly small missions organization, so everybody knows one another. He said, I met this person on the plane, and they led me to Jesus, and here's their name. And everybody he talked to said, never heard of them. When he told me this story, I started crying myself, and I started wondering the same thing that he said which was when it was all said and done, I thought I was led to Jesus by, I don't even know that was a person. Was that an angel that God sent to me? He said, I, I've chosen to believe that it was an angel, that God knew where I was. He knew what I needed. And it's not, if you know the biblical story, it's not beyond God to do that very thing. So he, he quit worrying about trying to find this person. He said, you know, that's miraculous. And to this day, he's a, he's a passionate follower of Jesus. And he loves to tell that story, by the way. Well, who doesn't love to tell your salvation story? And then this morning, I did something I haven't done for a while, and I haven't talked to you about for a while. I went to 7-Eleven to get uh, some uh, coffee. And I had seen him before recently, but I hadn't seen my friend from the country of Eritrea, Abraham, Abraham. For a, for a long while, I was afraid he wouldn't be there. Because, you know, sometimes people go in and out of jobs pretty quickly and easily. But thankfully, he's been there the last time. And then the, thankfully this morning, he was there. And it, it, so many times, 
when I've been in there with him and we strike up a conversation about the Lord, in five minutes he says something that I just needed to hear. And uh, it happened again today. So my first thought as I walked outside of 7-Eleven with my coffee was, Lord, was that my angel for the day? Abraham? Um, he's my friend. He's, he's a real man, as far as I know. But I don't know if there's any angels working at 7-Eleven or not. But for me, in that moment, it was kind of that miraculous. And I, it, just, it just confirmed to me that, you know, yes, God, God wants to speak to us and talk to us if we're just open to it. So it's, it's amazing to me how many ways... God finds it working. So thank you for the All About Angels songs. Let's spend a few moments together uh, waiting on the Lord in worship. There'll be a microphone in the middle. Obviously, people be, uh, behind that camera can't use that microphone. But you're free to either just run right through this next slide and continue on or stop it. I would encourage you to stop for a few moments at least and do what we're going to do, which is just wait quietly before the Lord and see if there's anything he might say to you and maybe even through you may not be in this moment but um, he may have something he wants to share with someone else through you and it's the same for us here so let's be quiet and still and know that he is God together thank you God for the opportunity to do this our lives are full busy, hectic. We have decisions, worries. We have joys. We have many, many things going on in our hearts and souls and minds. We pray that you would anoint this time and deal with any and all of that in a way that you see fit as we just try to push that aside, lay it down, and then let you do whatever it is you're going to do in us and through us. And we pray, thankfully, and rightly so, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Does this look familiar to you? Good few nods. <laughs> this is your weekly newsletter. You know, for considering the fact that we have a pandemic going on, we have a lot of stuff happening around here. It's too much to explain. It, it would take another 45 minutes. So I'm, I'm doing it this way just to let you know that there is information about such things as, the only one I'm going to mention at any length, is the fact that we have two services um, the weekend before Christmas, one like this on a Saturday afternoon, and another one um, on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And what we need you to do is let us know which one you want to be a part of. First come, first serve. So far, most people have chosen Sunday morning, I think. Last, the, the very first burst we got of RSVPs. But it'll help us kind of plan uh, as far as when we get... If we have, once we get enough for a Sunday morning, we'll just have to let people know it's Saturday afternoon or nothing. <laughs> and we do not have a Christmas Eve service, but what we're asking you to do, we've already had some great responses on this, is do one of two things. Make a 10 to 30 second Christmas video. Uh, one family group with that six kids from two different families stand in front of the Christmas tree. And really all they said, I think they just said, we miss you, wish you a Merry Christmas or said that little song, the, the tagline of the song over and over again. And that was it. It was wonderful. Uh, one of the Sunday school classes is practiced once. And without any prompting, some people, I said to make it Christmassy, uh, they sang, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas. It was wonderful. Um, one other person held up a, a Christmas, uh, it would be a snowman, but it was a, it was a Mexican snowman uh, 
uh, with, yeah, it's a little different. It was the Barreras. You'll have to check out the video. So and th this was just their practice run. They're going to do the real thing in two weeks on Zoom. So there's multiple ways to um, either do that or send us a photo. We have a couple of photos, just a photo of people. We'll put the nice, appropriate things on there with names and um, that sort of thing. And we hope to make a video with all of that and some other music that we're going to put together for you to have access to by Christmas Eve. And you can kind of use that as a way to connect and reconnect with uh, people you haven't seen for a while. Uh, so RSVP, take a Christmas Eve picture or make a 10 to 30 second video uh, greeting and then get it to us in the office. Try to get those to us two weeks from today. Uh, I think that's about all you need to know about that one. If you have any questions, look here or call us. We'll be glad to fill you in. Um, Mary, do we need to say anything about Christmas stockings this morning, this afternoon? They're here. You've got them. Some people in this group don't have them, right? Don't know. Okay. There's a teaser for you. The Christmas stockings. What's that? There we go. Okay. You people pick one up at the back if you don't have one. You people, if you want one, let us know. We'll get you one. Uh, there are a number of parties, one for the youth, one for the children, one for the Quaker chicks. Uh, and on the tw uh, next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we will have, uh, we've invited uh, families. So anybody uh, who's got kids, pretty much of any age, and we will sit in family groups around this room so we're separated from another with masks on and all the rest for a brief time together that's geared for the kids. And they'll be able to take some snacks home. We've also been asking for RSVPs on that and have gotten a great response. I'll be thrilled if we have 10 families. And I think we're going to have more than that. We have quite a few more that could, could do it. So uh, that's for family groups on the 13th. That sign out there on the bulletin board says that we raised $2,000 plus uh, from the, the um, bake sale and craft sale. It was actually $2,473.05 for missions. So thank you to whoever helped in any way, shape, or form to make that happen. That's in big red letters in your, uh, in your newsletter. So. There's a thing called Pen Friends, which is a way for us to reach out and simply write um, some greeting cards to people shut-ins, okay, at the Argyle on 38th. If, if that's something you feel like you need to do or want to do, we need the more people, the merrier. Uh, it's a blessing to sit down with that card and write it. And in this case, we still won't know who it's to, but just to a dear one. You know, Jesus loves you, praying for you, that, that kind of thing. For people that may not get anything like that. So that's what Pen Friend is all about. Those are the only things I'm going to mention because I'm out of time. Do you remember this at all? Does this look familiar to you? You can put that up, that first slide of my sermon. Um, two years ago, now you can't see it really easy, easily in the room. You were all given one of these, and I happen to have a stack of them today. So, um, for those of you that want one right this minute... Uh, because I'm going to ask you a question. Phil has already volunteered to pass them out. They came fresh off the copy machine. So me and Phil are the only people to handle these, if you're worried about that. I don't think too many people are worried too much more about paper. Uh, here you go, Phil. Yep. And if you want one, just raise your hand. Phil would be glad to give you one. But two, year, two Christmas seasons ago... Uh, we talked through this a little bit, and by a little bit, what I mean is this. There's 137 names on this um, that all are taken out of Scripture and have some reference to who Jesus is. Literally, titles, but also descriptions of who He is. And it's a little bit overwhelming when you sit down and look through all of that. We actually read two years ago... I think I read each one of them, and you repeated them, and it was kind of powerful to hear all these titles and all of these names given to Christ. Uh, the point being, He is 
anything and everything that we need him to be. And I could say, and more, very easily. So there's lists that have 150 I've seen. I've seen all kinds of different, different lists. Some of them, they, they play with the Scripture a little bit to get a title. That doesn't bother me. I just love descriptions of Jesus and who he is and what he does. So here's my quick question to you. Do you what do you see on here that represents... Um, that, uh, that uh, names here that portray in some way, shape, or form that Christ is light. Christ is light. L- yell one of them out to me. That's the easy one, right? It's the big, bright yellow one. I think you can even see that from out there. Light of the world. What else? There's six of them that I count. The great light. Yes. What else? Bright and morning star, yes. A light of revelation, yes. We've got all but two. Son of righteousness. Now, in case somebody didn't name one that I named, I, here's, the, here's the answer to that. You could actually argue that every one of these names speaks to the fact that he is the light and it is revealed to us in all of these ways. That's not one I had circled, but I do have two more. Hope what? Hope of, Hope of glory. I don't have that one circled. There's no wrong answer here. I circled day spring because what happens in the morning? The day spring, the, the morning starts. And it's a little bit connected to bright and morning star, but that's for another day to talk of how. Over on the left side, I also circled image of the invisible God. Without light, you can't see any image or any reflection. So Jesus is the light. He provides the light. And without him, we couldn't get the true picture of who God is. He said that himself. If you want to know the Father, look at me. So I cheated a little bit, maybe. (laughs) Without light, you can't see any image or reflection. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. It's from Hebrews. So today, though, I want to speak about one, a light. I, we've already kind of just touched bases there on uh, Jesus is the light of the world. And one of the ways I've been doing that this last week is just kind of contemplating the reality of physical light and how that might m- mean something to the reality that Jesus is our light. Uh, I'm not a science teacher, and it's a good thing because we'd go into a whole science thing. And if you look it up at Wikipedia, who doesn't use Wikipedia, what is light? Well, the science teacher would tell you it's light or visible light is electromagnetic radiation within the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that can be perceived by the human eye. Understood? You got that? Um, that we could go on and talk about the wavelengths of infrared and ultraviolet wavelengths and photons and all of that part. But there was one little word in what I read to you very rapidly. A spectrum that can be perceived by the human eye. Fundamentally, light is what allows us to see. Period. That's the simplest way to think of it. It's not a scientific fancy definition, but fundamentally, light allows us to see, and we're so used to that, we don't even think about the miracle of it or the mystery of it. You see, eyeballs were made to perceive light and therefore to see objects within their view. Our main source of light, and here's where the test comes in, without even a lecture, I'm going to test you, and you'll get the answer, I'm sure. Main source of light on the earth is the sun. Very good. You paid attention to some teacher somewhere along the line, or you're just very perceptive. 
that's that bright hot ball of hydrogen and helium at the center of our solar system. Okay, t- test number two. The moon gets its light from the sun. You know, I, I, I was taught that too, but you forget that sometimes. When I walked out this morning, the moon was out, and I looked up at it, and I was prepared, but I didn't even think about it then. I just thought, wow, that object up there is actually reflecting the sun, and the reason I can see it is because of the light. It's not even a, it's not, it's not direct. The light is bouncing off of that object many, many miles away. Um, speaking of the sun and the earth, uh, how big is our main light source in comparison to where we are? Main light source in comparison to where we are on this globe. It's 864,000 miles. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the, I, 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 let me, I missed, made a mistake. The diameter of the sun, there we go, is 864,000 miles, okay? The diameter, which makes it 109 times wider than Earth. The circumference is 2.7 plus million miles. On average, the sun is 93 miles from the Earth because we don't always get we're a little bit further away from it at times. On average, 93 million miles from the Earth. It would take 1,430,769 hours to drive there at 65 miles per hour. So I don't know if anybody's going to try that anytime soon. That's 59,615 days. On um, driving around the circumference, at 65 miles per hour, once you got there, would only take 41,861 hours. That's 1,744 days, which is about 4.8 years. That's if you drove the whole time. And I, I, I said all of this just for my wife, because we drove to California and back, and it seemed like forever to get there and back. And that was just 23 hours. So driving to the moon and around uh, the sun and around the sun from our earth, this light source of ours, the sun, would be an amazing feat. Oh, I forgot. It's 4.8 years without rest stops or filling up with gas or spending the night. It might take a little longer in that case. So that's, that's a little bit about the source of light, how far away it is and how big it is. Something to contemplate. What was life like before the invention of the light bulb? Because forever, up until 1800s, mid to late 1800s, people didn't have light bulbs or light sources like we think of when we think of turn on the light. Uh, what was life like? Now, we've all seen enough movies of times like that to kind of get a feel for it. But... But I'm sure glad that I don't have to live in those times and figure out how to illuminate anything when it's dark, to mess around with kerosene lamps, candles, fireplaces, gas lamps. Those were some of the ways you could light up things after dark. And if you're moving in the dark, you had to figure out how to carry it around. Um, You depended on that flame, usually, to see. That's not very efficient, and it wasn't very bright. In fact, One 60-watt bulb gives you the same light as about 100 candles. And then came the invention, after millennia, after hundreds of years of even experimenting with electricity. People have been aware of electricity for a long time. But when they put the electricity part together with all the elements that you needed, the incandescent light bulb was born. All of us, in speaking of school, were probably taught that Edison invented the light bulb. Some historians list 22 inventors of incandescent lights, lamps, light bulbs, before Thomas Edison. He just had better materials and methods to create the things, uh, to create the energy that produced the light. He mastered and harnessed electricity, which had been understood really for millennia. In order to have incandescent light, you first have to have electricity. You have to have a source of power for light, channeled in such a way so that it actually emits light and allows you to see. 
You sang a song this morning, and I was glad you sang the exact verse. You can sing it again with me now. should be up there. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light, and there it is, light. While He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Glory to the newborn King. Light and life to all he brings. In the book of Isaiah, there's a promise. And my initial thought was to just read the promise. And the more I looked at a little bit of Scripture before that, I thought, I'm going to read just the Scripture to you today. And we'll pick up the rest of the story on light next week. And the significance and the importance of Jesus Christ being the light of the world. But as far as the book of Isaiah is concerned, there's a a familiar scripture to a lot of us. We see it on on cards. It's in some of the songs that we sing. Uh, If you like Handel's Messiah, it's it's featured in there. Not real often because the song that goes with it isn't real beautiful. It's one of the prettier ones because of the subject matter in part. But in the book of Isaiah, leading up to chapter 9, you've already had all the significant themes of Isaiah. All the really, really high things and the really, really low things. The things that are easy to listen to and easy to grasp a hold of. And Yeah, that's good. And the things that are very hard to hear. I'm sure it was the same way for the people who originally got this prophecy and heard it or read it. I'm just going to read to you some of the highlights that I have, things I have underlined. And listen, Pay attention. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel, my people, as God is saying, doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams. I want no more of your pious meetings. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. This is heavy and harsh, and it's the first chapter. But still in the first chapter is this. Come now. Let's settle this says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you'll be devoured by the sword of your enemies. And then it goes back to the hard stuff. I'm just reading different lines here. Your, your leaders are rebels. That's one of them. Their land is full of idols. The people worship things they have made with their own hands. So now they will be humbled and all will be brought low. Do not forgive them. Crawl into caves in the rocks. Hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. Human pride will be brought down and human arrogance will be humbled. There will be a day of reckoning. That gets repeated in that chapter. End of chapter 2. Don't put your trust in mere humans. They're as frail as breath. What good are they? I'll keep skipping through here. 
He gives the story of his calling, which most of you remember, him going into the temple, seeing the Lord high and lifted up, and an angel coming and speaking to him. And he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And then he's cleansed and made holy, and called to go speak forth God's message, and speak it forth, indeed he does. Let me skip over to verse, to chapter 8. The Lord is giving me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said, uh, let, me, let me back up. That's the first time when I read this, the first time I thought, wow, this day and age, is that a word for you and me or not? It's spoken 700 years before Christ. And it applies to people then, people after that, people during Christ's time on earth. And it still speaks to us today. Verse 11 of chapter 8, there's, there's several things in here that when I put them in our context, they somehow become even more powerful. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one you should that should make you tremble. He will keep your life safe. Wow. Even leading into this new year, with the new president coming on, most likely. <laughs> we can argue about that one all we want. But I really, I, I love this exhortation. Don't think like everybody else. Don't call everything a conspiracy. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy. Lift him up. Let's talk about him and who he is and what he's all about and what he's doing. He's the one who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. For the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble and fall. Never to rise again, they will be snared and captured. Preserve the teaching of God. Entrust these instructions to those who follow me. I will wait for the Lord who's turned away from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. I and the children the Lord has given me serve as signs and warnings to Israel from the Lord of heaven's armies who dwells in his temple on Mount Zion. Someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. With, with their whisperings and mutterings, they will tell us what to do. Let's ask the psychologist and the psychiatrists of our day, the leading thinkers, the people who have any number of explanations of what's going on in our world. Let's talk to them, see what they say. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Now here's where it's getting close to the promise of a Messiah in this case. 700 years before Jesus actually came. Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down at the earth, but wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. I don't mean to depress you on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> I really don't. Um, but this is God's word, and it all leads up to the scripture that's probably on the screen. Yep. There'll be trouble and anguish and dark despair. I can see that happening this day and age right here and now. They'll be thrown out into the darkness. Nevertheless, wow, I can take a breath, a breath, because something good is going to happen. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and the despair will not go on forever. <laughs> 
I, I keep thinking of political solutions because that, that's, that's the, what is on our mind a lot. You know, I, I want to add to this. Uh, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever because we'll have a change and the Congress will help or not help and it'll all be good. It'll all work out because of that, right? No, not likely. Could be better. Could be a whole lot worse. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. One way to paraphrase that is this. There's going to come a time in a faraway place, and it's an out-of-the-way kind of a place, and an out-of-the-way kind of a village, when you least expect it, it'll be filled with glory. And then comes this. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine again a prophecy of the coming Christ. And if you skip on down, another familiar verse, verse 6. How's this going to happen? Well, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. There's so much content just in those two verses, and I got five verses after that, but we'll do those next week. Let me just say this to kind of pull this together. Karen played O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and I had read that passage out of Peter, which basically dealt with the second coming of Christ. And, it based, and then it said at the end, so it, this is again a paraphrase, in the meantime, live in peace, be at peace, well, what is the connection between, the, you can't see it as well as I hoped you could, but that little baby up there that represents Jesus, <laughs> it helps me think of who he was and just the whole miracle and mystery of God becoming a baby and being this light that's going to shine you can't even compare it in, in comparison with the sun being our main source of light. But Jesus himself declared, I am the light of the world. People had to wait a long, long time for Jesus to come, didn't they? It was promised. I don't know how many people figured it out because of Isaiah, what that really meant. The, the rabbis and the teachers of the law probably understood they just didn't want to accept that Jesus was the fulfillment of that, that he was the light that came that would deliver people from darkness, abject darkness. They had to wait a long time for that. We've had to wait a long time for Jesus to return and to come back. That is the connection. It's going to happen. The words to the song that Karen played, verse 2, say this, O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. And now, I think we can legitimately pray that prayer. Come, day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here, thy coming here now. He's here. It's a matter of us opening up and preparing for whatever it is he wants to do among us. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night. And death's dark shadows put to flight. To me, the writer of a song like that is no different than, the, than, than Paul writing. Why would he write that? Because he knows that it can happen. It's probably happened in his life. The despair, the gloom, the darkness was put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come, shall come to thee. O oh, Israel, he'll come back to us. The last verse, which we don't normally sing, I don't think. O oh, come, desire. 
of nations. Bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease. And be thyself our king of peace. The people who walked in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Go to the page with the um, song on it. Uh, it's the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. Do you have that? That's it. Okay, we'll finish the rest of this next week. I just wanted to get you thinking about Jesus being the light of the world. What does that mean to you? I don't have a lot of profound things to say about it, to be honest with you. What more can you say than what he has already said? I am the light of the world. There's always a testimony that goes with that, the reality of it as it works in our lives. This is not a Christmas song, but uh, I've been thinking about it all week. So we're going to kind of do it together. And if you don't even know the song, all you got to do is sing, The light of the world is Jesus. That's your only line you have to know. So if I sing, The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Let sunshine at noonday his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Stand with me, with me if you would, and we'll finish it. You're going to sing that line over and over again. So I'm hoping when you leave here today, you will have declared it. It's in your head, your heart, your mind, your soul. That that won't escape you as you face your life as it is. You know, I don't like this and that, and this is hard, and I'm depressed, and whatever it is. But you know what? It's a little bit like the last week. I choose Jesus. I choose joy. How about in the midst of what we're all facing together, we sing, but the light of the world is Jesus. And I know because of what he's done in my life. Let's start at the beginning. We'll do it a little faster and with a little differently than we sang straight. Okay. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our God. Guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes. The light of the world is Jesus. Go wash at his bidding, the light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light Stunned upon me once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. 
tis shining for thee sweetly the light has dawned upon me once i was blind but now i can see the light of the world is jesus <laughs> two things before i let you go i wish dave amdahl was here today hopefully he'll watch it he always asks me when we sing a cappella hymns he goes why don't we do that more often i can hear everybody's voice that was wonderful thank you for singing and i have an assignment for you you sang these words you dwellers in darkness with sin blinded eyes the light of the world is Jesus. Go, wash at his bidding, and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. I'm almost certain that is a specific reference. That's all I'm going to say to something. That go wash at his bidding, and light will arise. See if you can tell me this week. Get back to me and tell me what you think that refers to. Jesus, it occurs to me that if the only thing we take with us today is the glory of knowing that the people that walk in darkness, and some of us, that's been us, some of us, it is us right now. Lord, we know that you know that we have moments in time even as believers that are kind of dark and dreary. And in the middle of those, you are still the light of the world. And as we walk in darkness, you have a great light for us to see. Thank you that you never give up on that. So as we leave today, may that truth and that reality ring in our hearts, ring in our ears, ring in our souls, and it would become a point of celebration and a point of declaration at our points of darkness, things that are getting us down and keeping us down. Just as in Isaiah, there's, there's the reality of all that's wrong, and then there's the promise. May we also hear you say, come on, let's talk about this. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Your, though your sins be as scarlet, I can make them white as snow. Over and over and over again, you do that in our lives when we come to you and ask for forgiveness. So you are a good God, and we are grateful to have been here to sing your praises. May angels attend us for sure, but your Holy Spirit, send your Holy Spirit to teach us and train us what the light and the life of Jesus Christ is all about for us. And I thank you for what Doug shared today, Lord, this consistent call to share that light and life with others uh, so that they don't have to walk in darkness. Make that as important to us as anything as we go today, as we work our way through the week. We praise you for it all, and we thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen.